I wonder how many of you have ever stood at a voting booth or stared at a ballot box feeling completely overwhelmed by the weight of the decision that you were about to make. I mean, whether it's a local election, a statewide election, or a presidential election, like literally there are things that bring us anxiety when we're making decisions. And here's the thing. We get to decide. But decisions are difficult sometimes. And I, I, I threw that whole thing out there because I knew that the tension that, that it would create when I started talking about voting would be awesome. Because this series is not about voting at all. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about it. I just wanted to lean in because I, I, I do believe that it's valuable information. And I think we have to lean into the fact that the decisions that you make impact your life. They may impact your friend's life and your family's life. Decisions that we make, big or small, determine the direction of our lives and the kind of impact that we want to leave behind. Now, there's a passage of Scripture that, that I think is a great passage that, that I want to launch with today. It's found in the book of Psalm, verse 32 and verse 8. It says, the Lord says, God, your life, I will advise you and watch over you. I'll just be honest with you. I think that right now we need some God-given wisdom and decision-making that we're making like never before because decision-making seems complicated. And over the next four weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about decisions that we make. We're going to talk about how do we know if we're making wise decisions? Uh, what filter do we use to make sure that the decisions that we're making are good for us and they're actually biblical decisions that we're making, and that they're going to have the longest lasting impact in our lives. It was interesting this past week, I realized something about research. Researchers say that we make 35,000 decisions a day. 35,000 decisions a day. When I broke that down, I realized that we make one decision every 2.46 seconds. A decision is made. That means in the course of, of the sermon that I'm preaching today, you're going to make 941 decisions before you walk out of here today. You're going to make 941 decisions. So I wonder, I'm actually hoping that some of those decisions aren't to tune me out, that they're actually to listen to what, what might be going on. But, but we're making decisions. How many of you have ever made a decision and then recognized it was a wrong decision? Anybody ever make a wrong decision in your life? Uh, some of you have never done that. I want to hang out with you because I love hanging out with liars. Um, I just no judgment here at all. But let's think for a moment. We are literally a decision-making factory, each and every one of us. And if each and every one of us are making 35,000 decisions in one day, some are big, some are small. Some are like, what am I going to eat this morning? Some are like, what am I going to wear today? Some are like, you know, am I going to go to church today? Like, those are big decisions that we're making. Some of you are making decisions, who am I going to spend the rest of my life with? Who am I going to marry? Some of you are making monumental decisions saying, maybe I don't want to be married anymore. Like, those are still huge decisions monumental decisions that we make every day and it's no wonder so many people are overwhelmed anxious unsure about whether they're making the right decisions the right choices from where do we go to eat to what do we wear to how do we respond to a political argument that we find online how many of you have ever watched somebody post something online that infuriated you anybody ever had that happen how many of you have ever wanted to respond yeah I, I would, I, I'm not going to ask you how many of you did respond, because then it gets awkward um, on so many levels. But here's the problem, is you have to make a split-second decision sometimes whether you're going to respond or not. Because I don't know about you, but like in my, in my marriage, there are some times that I, I have a thought and I should not speak. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Uh, if my wife's in here, she's, she, I'm surprised she's not yelling it out. Uh, and, and there are times that I do not do the right thing. There are times that, let me, let, let's, just, let's just get really gut level honest. How many of you have ever responded to your spouse in a way that you knew was going to make them mad and you did it on purpose because you wanted to make them mad? Anybody ever do that? Like you just kind of, you want to poke the bear. 
Like some of you aren't raising your hand because your spouse is next to you. Like, I ain't raising my hand. I'm going to get in trouble for that. But, but we know how to poke the bear. Like we're like, eh, <laughs> let's see how that one goes. Like we're launching missile codes right at them on purpose. Like we do that. And I, some of you are looking at me like, man, I don't, my pastors are really not a good person. Thank you. I recognize that. I know that. I struggle. Do you know that, do you know how decision making is affecting the next generation? People in their 20s and 30s, it says over 70% of Gen Z struggles with anxiety about making decisions that will impact their future. 70%, guys. If you're in that genre, you know what it's like. Where am I going to get a job? What am I going to do for the rest of my life? Am I ever going to get married? How, how, how do I know I'm making the right decisions? And I'm telling you, there are decisions, they come in at 35000 per day. So for us to think that decision-making isn't hard, it would be, it's, it's foolish for us to say that. And, and here's the thing. It's not just big decisions. It's small ones like what to believe. Who do I follow? What, what trends should I keep up with? And how do I respond to issues today in po today's political climate that is so tense right now? Every new cycle that we walk through presents a whole new choice, a whole new dilemma, a whole new challenge. And if we don't allow God to help us in our decision making, I promise you, out of those 35,000 decisions that we're making every day, we're probably going to make some pretty whopping doozy bad ones. So here's the truth. It's not about what decisions you make. It's about how do you go about making those decisions that matters. Do you see? Because if you get a right, a right structure on how to make wise decisions, you'll end up making wise decisions. The problem is most of us are just winging it. Like, has anybody ever had a friend who you had planned on doing something for the weekend and like you kind of had plans, but they were just tentative plans. But then you have a, a certain friend who literally, they don't want to get pinned down until like right at the last minute because they're always buying the options to see what's going to be a better decision. Like maybe somebody else is going to do something more fun or, or somebody else is going to do something more entertaining or exciting. And so like you wait till the last minute and say, hey, are you hanging out with us? Oh, Oh, man, I really wanted to do that thing that you're doing. But something came up, and you made a different decision. Like, we have those things. But here's what I want to call us to today. I believe that God calls us to pre-decide. Pre-decide, which means making decisions in advance grounded in his wisdom and his values. If we learn how to pre-decide, especially the large decisions in our lives, and we're, and we're filtering those through the filter of God and the way he would decide in his value system and not our own, I can promise you we can have a much better feel for how is this decision going to impact my life? Because I know this, the quality of your decisions shapes your entire life. And it will determine the quality of life that you live. Think about that. Do you, ever, do you ever see people like that seem to live these incredibly fulfilled lives? Like, and, and I know that you're, you and I are both kind of just looking at those things through the lens and the filter of, of Instagram and social media. But like they, they, it looks like they have great relationships, meaningful work, they have peace, while, while other people... People like me and maybe people like you are constantly struggling with anxiety and, and emptiness. And sometimes it, it becomes like the first group of people, we think they're smarter than us. What if they're not smarter? Because I don't think they are. I don't think that people who feel like, like when you look at their life and it looks like they have it all together, I don't believe that they're smarter than us. I believe that what has happened, it is, doesn't make them intellectually superior to us. They're not more talented than us. We're not broken. What, what happens is it's the decisions determine your direction and your destiny. 
And so what's happened is those people who look like they seem to have it more together have learned how to filter the decision-making process of their life through the word of God, which helps them to when it's you decide, they realize I need to include somebody else in this decision. I know this for me. Whenever I've made poor decisions, usually if somebody asks me about that decision and I make the statement, yeah, I know, but I'm gonna go ahead and do this anyway because I kind of feel like this is what I should do. And everybody keeps saying, "Eh, mm, 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 I don't know. Maybe maybe you should reconsider that. And I'm like, no, I'm good, I'm good. I love it when... When you've got five people <coughs> who are godly people who tell you maybe the decision that you're making isn't the greatest decision of your life, and you go, but God told me so. I'm like, oh, he told five godly people the, the, another thing. Maybe you should consider what he told them. Just, cons- just process it. Because sometimes, it says in Proverbs 16, 3, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. This reverse reminds us that when we commit our decisions, all of our decisions, every one of our decisions to the Lord, he guides us. He establishes the path that we should walk in. So often though, man, we just don't commit our decisions to him. We just, we just wake up and just wing it all the time. Based on what we feel, and then we freeze up and we go, oh, maybe I made the wrong decision. You see, here's the biggest problem. I want to talk about the problem and I want to talk about the solution. The problem with decision making is most of us are not great decision makers. How many of you know somebody who's not a good decision maker? Raise your hand. Thank you for admitting that, see? You just admitted for yourself. It's good. Like, see, that's the thing. We're like, yeah, I know somebody else. But like, that was a trick question. Um, But like, we're not really good decision makers. Like, how, how often do we say something in anger that we regret later? Hmm. Interesting how sometimes what happens in our lives is we get stuck with bad decisions because we're just, we're not great decision makers. I mean, how often have you ever bought something that you could not afford? Anybody ever buy something you could not afford? Hmm. How many times have you chosen to stay in a relationship that wasn't healthy even though you knew it wasn't healthy because you were afraid of being alone? How many of us know what's right, but we don't always do it? And the truth is, the problem isn't new. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with this. The guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament made a a very declarative statement about his inability to make good decisions. He wrote a whole chapter on it. If you want to study that chapter, I would encourage you this week, break down Romans chapter 7. And just unpack Romans chapter 7. And just look at a guy who literally, we would look on the outside and go, it looks like he has it all together. But on the inside, he struggled. And chapter 7 and verse 15 is kind of the pinnacle verse. In the whole thing here, he says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. And what I hate, I do. What I hate. The thing I hate the thing I don't like, the thing that doesn't make me feel good is the thing that I seem to always do. Why? Why are we such bad decision makers? Here's what I think. I think we're bad decision makers because we're bombarded with options. Think about this. If we're bombarded with options, that fills in the gap of 35,000 decisions every single day. I want to give you a case in point. How many of you have ever been to the Cheesecake Factory? How many of you have ever been to the Cheesecake Factory? They do not have a menu. They have a book. That is not a menu. It is a book. It's an encyclopedia of food. And I have tried lots of things because usually a restaurant that has that many options, most of them, they're going to have a couple that are good, but a lot of them aren't good. And I've tried a lot of variety. They're all freaking good. Like, it's, it's, it's disturbing. But, like, making a decision when there's, like, two pages worth of cheesecake options? Seriously. How is one person supposed to decide that? Like, and then I love it. 
because, you know, I'm trying to watch my fatty liver, you know, as I've been telling you guys for a couple months, and, uh, and I'm, I'm doing pretty good at it. So then you go to the Cheesecake Factory, and they have this, this encyclopedia of good food, and then they have a skinny licious menu that has six items on it, you know, and you're like, oh, oh, so the fat people get like six items, and you're like, that's all you can eat here. Everything else is for everyone else. So me and my fatty liver get six options and everybody else gets every other option that they want. And, and, that, that, and we wonder, like, have you, have, you, have you gone car shopping in a while? Like, you can get one car and have thousands of options on one car. Well, would you like it to have Apple CarPlay? Would you, would you like this one to have tires on it? Like, if you want it to have tires, like, that's going to be an extra charge, like, if you want tires. Like, we, the, the price that we showed you online doesn't include tires or a steering wheel, but those are additional options. We can add those for you, like, for, uh, it's, a, it's a nominal fee. It really is a nominal fee. Um, but we have options. Do you know that that's an actual scientific problem? There was a cognitive scientist, his name was Barry Schwartz, and here's what he said. He called it a paradox of choice. Here's the definition of the paradox of choice. The more options people have, the harder it becomes to make a decision, and the less satisfied they are with the decision that they make. Let us go back to ordering at a restaurant. How many of you have painstakingly decided what you were going to order at a restaurant and then all the food came out and somebody else's order, it came out and you're like, gosh, I ordered the wrong thing. I should have ordered what they ordered. How many of you have that has ever happened to you? You're like, duh, it's the paradox of choice. Ah, they made the wrong choice. Ah. Yeah, you know, when, when our staff goes out, like they, we, we have had this, there's this running joke that if our staff goes out to eat for any, anything, that inevitably something will go wrong with my meal. Like it just, I am just, the, I'm the magnet for something. And, and so I, I honestly live with this paradox of choice, especially when it comes to food, because I'm like, eh, no, I think I'm gonna get this. And then somebody else's food comes out and you're like, gosh, man. So, like, I have a very giving wife, and, like, I'll look at her plate, and I'm like, man, that looks, is yours good? Man. She'll go, do you want mine? I was like, oh, well, you know, how about we just share? And sharing just means I'm just taking whatever's left over of hers, and I'm going to have that. And then she'll take mine in a home, in a doggy bag, and feed it to Ashlyn. Um, <laughs> that's story of our lives. But you know, the problem is, this paradox of choice, you know what we end up having? We have decision fatigue. How many of you have ever gotten fatigued by the decisions that you had to make throughout a week? You could just get fatigued, and so you know what we do? When we get decision fatigue, we stop making decisions because we're afraid we'll make the wrong decision. So we make no decision at all. An indecision is a decision, and it's the enemy of progress. Your indecision literally will wreck you. We have to make decisions. I don't, <clears throat> decisions matter. An indecision equals instability. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. We're going to unpack this a little bit deeper today. It says this. If you need wisdom, so we need wisdom to make right decisions. So we need to seek the Lord. It says this, ask our generous God. He will give it to you. He won't rebuke you for asking, but when you ask, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Guys, there is a formula here. I want us to, I want to leave this verse up here because we've got to unpack this. Because the problem is so many times we're saying that we're seeking the Lord in our decisions, but what we're not doing is we're not turning the decision over to him. What we're actually doing is we're trying to get God to agree with my decision. Has anybody ever struggled? Like, I struggle with that. Like, I'm not asking God for his decision. I'm not asking God for him to change my mind. I am somehow going to God in prayer trying to change his mind. And it says this, when you ask, don't skip verse 6. Be sure that your faith is in God alone. Not your ability to make good decisions. Not that the decision is going to be best for you, but it's like, God, I can't make this decision 
without you. And I won't make this decision without you. And then it goes on. It says, don't waver. For a person who's with divided loyalties is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed in the wind. And I think that some of us have lived this last verse over the last couple of weeks, and it appears as though we're going to live it again on Wednesday. And it's interesting that God uses this analogy of wind and waves that get tossed to and fro, and yet this very same God that we talk about in, in the book of Matthew, when the disciples are wrecked by a storm, it says even the winds and the waves obey him. So we can trust a God when the storms in our life come and we're struggling with making a wise decision and the winds come and the waves blow and we're kind of tossed around with decisions, we can go, wait a minute, I wonder if I can rest in the wave maker. I wonder if I can rest in the wind maker and the wind calmer. But you see, we, we don't rest in that if we go, well, maybe God can do it, maybe God can't. There's a word in here called waver. The word waver in the Greek, if you look it up in the Greek, is um, dipsychosis, which means double-minded or indecisive, resulting in instability. Double-minded or indecisive. How many of you would say that occasionally you get stuck with paralysis of analysis and it's hard for you to make a decision. It's interesting. Um, every time Susie and I ever bought a house uh, or built a house, um, like I, I will never forget the very first house we bought. We lived in Zephyr Hills um, and we bought this, this little small house and like we were like, we were thrilled to have this house, but I remember going to sign at the, closing, at the closing day. And we're on our way there, and Susie is losing her mind. She's like, we can't afford to do this. We can't do this. This isn't a good decision. I, don't know. I was like, baby, we, we, it's already done. We're doing this thing. We've got to do this. Like, we are to sign it. But, honey, you understand, like, we're on the hook for the whole thing. Like, like we're going to pay. I was like, not today. Like, they're going to let us make these things called payments. It's going to be awesome. And, and it'll be cheaper than the rent that we're paying in the one-bedroom apartment that we're living in. I think this is a good idea. But, like, that kind of stuff builds anxiety in her. And so sometimes we get stuck with not making decisions. Can I tell you, in the political, in the political arena that we find ourselves in today, here's what some people will do. Some people will choose not to do anything because they go, I don't know... And, and I'll just tell you, if you think that either side of the party is right biblically, you're probably wrong. Because I don't know that either party has, has, a, has a handle on biblical accuracy. They, 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 they just don't. And, and so, so I'm, that, that's why, like, here, we don't, like, move into the political scene. I believe this. You have to pray and seek the Lord and then look at the Word of God. That's what you're called to do. Like, we should look at the Word of God and say, what does this, how does this line up with God's Word? Not my Word, not culture's Word, not the government's Word. What does the Word of God say? And then make a decision. The problem with making decisions is sometimes we trust emotions over logic. Like we just trust our feelings. You know, I just, I just go with how I feel today. Let me just tell you something. I feel like eating double cheeseburgers every day. And my fatty liver says I shouldn't trust that kind of emotional logic. It doesn't make sense. And the reason we, we struggle with decision making is we're trusting our logic and our emotions over logic. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but it ends, but in the end it leads to death. If you rely on your emotions exclusively, we're prone to make decisions that feel right in the moment, but ultimately lead to the wrong path. And I wonder how many of us have done that. Like, I've talked to people, and uh, they're trying to curb an emotional feeling that they have, 
And so they go have a drink. And that one drink made them feel a little bit better. So if one made you feel better, two would make you feel even more, more better, because that's good English. Um, and, and, and then three would make you feel most better. And then you're like, whoo. Well, and then pretty soon what happens is this emotion over logic takes over. And one emotional decision can lead to a lifetime of regret in a path that we never intended to take. Now, the reason why I want to talk about decision making is I believe that all of us are feeling this tension of decision making. It doesn't matter who you are or, or where you, you find yourself. Like decision making is difficult because you go, well, if I make this decision, it's going to impact me financially here. If I make this decision, it's going to impact me relationally here. And like, so how do I make and know that I'm making the right decisions? I believe this, that we've, we realize that we, we struggle with making decisions because of, because of some pretty real issues. But what's the key to making great decisions? The key to making a great decision is pre-deciding. And I want to give you a couple of quick things on how to do that. I believe this pre-deciding provides power. When you pre-decide, you have the power. In other words, you're not making a decision out of emotion. You're making a decision out of something that you have thought through logically, and now you've pre-decided, when I do this, this is probably going to occur, and I think that's good and wise. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit to the Lord whatever you do. Whatever you do. And he will establish your plans. So notice this. We commit what we're doing first, and the plans come afterwards. We commit what we're doing. We say, God, whatever I'm doing in this area of my life, in my relational life, in my financial life, in my corporate life, like, God, I'm committing those to you. Now, God, you work out how that plan works out in my life. I'm going to make this decision based upon you and based upon the wisdom that I have from you, and God, I want you to carry that thing out. Think about this. An Olympic athlete doesn't wait until the day of the race to decide whether or not they're going to give it their best, do they? Well, unless you're the break dancer from Australia. And that just goes without saying. If you haven't watched that video, like, you must be, you should watch the video. Just type in on your phone on YouTube, Australian breakdancer. I didn't know breakdancing was an Olympic sport, but they gave medals out for it this year. We just give medals out for anything. So one day, people are going to pick their nose, and the biggest booger picker is going to get a medal. And I, that sounds awkward. That's just kind of where I'm tracking. But, but think about this. It's like they've already pre-decided. If you're going to the, into the Olympics, you have pre-decided that you are going to train hard. You're going to eat right. You're going to give 100%. Regardless of how they feel on race day, their decision to win started miles ago, months ago, years ago. They started before the moment of competition. Pre-deciding provides power when temptation comes too. You see this, if you're, if, you're, if you're single and you're dating in here, when you pre-decide that you're going to keep yourself pure until your marriage with someone before God, what you did is you pre-decided so when, when that dude walks into you ladies, he goes, baby, you look good. You go, I know I do. And he goes, baby, you know, if you love me, I do love you. Just because I love you doesn't mean you get, you get free reign of all this. Like, I, I pre-decided then I'm going to honor Jesus first and foremost in my life. I made a decision. So you can't sway my decision because I pre-decided. It's kind of the Dave Ramsey principle for our finances where he says, you say, you say no because you, you already said, said yes to something before. It's easy to say no if you already said yes to Jesus. You pre-decided. There's some biblical examples of pre-deciding. There's some pretty monumental ones. Abraham pre-decided in Genesis 22. You, you know that he, he couldn't have a child until he was almost 100 years old. His wife was 90. He was 99. Um, 
and uh, and like nobody thought he was ever going to give birth. And, uh, and then he did give birth to his son Isaac, and he loved his son Isaac. And in Genesis 22, God tells him to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him. What? But see, Abraham predecided that he was going to honor the Lord. And so look at verses 2 and 3. It says, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and I want you to go to the land of Moriah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning... Abraham got up early, saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. And then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place that God told him about. This wasn't the first time that Isaac set out for a place that God told him about. When he left the cow of Er, the Er of Chaldees, that's who Abraham was, that's where he lived. It says that God showed up to him and he said, go to a land that I will show you. And it says that Abraham left and went to the land that God showed him. It's not the first time. He pre-decided that he would just trust God, this God who led him all along his life, this God who allowed his wife Sarah to get pregnant even though she was well past childbearing age. He said, I trust him. If he is asking me to do this, then he, I, I, I believe this. I believe Abraham believed that if God was going to have him sacrifice Isaac, that he would also raise Isaac from the dead. I believe that's the truth. And here's why. Because he already knew that God doesn't break his promises. And God said through Isaac, he was all nations would be blessed through Abraham. So God, Abraham said, he was God's before he was mine. And then I want you to notice something else in verses 7 and 8 in this. It says, Isaac turns to Abraham and, and he said, Father. Yes, son. This has been an interesting camping conversation. Go, go have this camping conversation with your son next time you go camping. He said, we have the fire. We have the wood. Uh, where's the sheep for the burnt offering? I love Abraham's response. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. There's another version of scripture that says, God will provide himself an offering. God will provide himself an offering. And they both walked on together. I want you to see the the trust that Isaac had with his dad in his decision making. He trusted his father's decisions. And then look at verse 12, same chapter. I think things get a little tense when they get the fire ready and and then uh, you ask your teenage boy, Isaac, now son, don't mind me, I'm just gonna tie you up now. Like, does anybody else think this is kooky? Like, he ties him up, he puts him on the altar. Like, I don't know if I just go, hey, Dad, this is a really cool trick. I don't, but um, I, I don't know if I signed up for this. I want you dads to think about the kind of predecision it takes for Abraham to walk that whole thing out. To walk it out to where he, he takes he takes a knife up and he's ready to kill his son. In verse 22, right at that moment, in verse 12, God speaks out. He says, don't lay a hand on the boy. Now I know you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son Son, he predecided to love you and to love me. Predecision is God's idea. It's not our idea. God did it first. When he predecided, once the fall of man happened, that he would predecide that he would redeem the world through his own son and his only son. Daniel did it. Daniel predecided. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, he finds himself under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. In the, in the uh, country of Babylon, and it says, but Daniel was determined. In other words, Daniel decided not to, be, not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Daniel pre-decided, no matter what happens, I'm not doing this. Can I tell you this? Your values will determine your decisions. You need to make sure that your values, if you want to make good decisions, make sure you have values that match the decision type that you want to make. 
Do you value integrity? Do you value faithfulness? Do you value generosity? Do you value purity? If you don't value those things, then the decisions that you make will, will only match that. Your values will determine the decisions that you make. So I want you to write down this question, or if you have the relevant church app downloaded, this question's already in there in the sermon notes. But here's the question. When faced with blank, I have predecided to blank. And that's what action are you going to take? When, when I'm faced with blank, the situation, I have predecided to blank. What action? Are you going to take? When you're tempted to make an impulse decision, you've pre decided. I'm going to wait three days. I'm going to pray about it before I make the decision. When I feel anxious or overwhelmed, I pre decided to take my burdens to God in prayer. When someone cuts me off in traffic, I pre decided not to flip them off. Maybe you should pre decide that. It's difficult if you drive on I 4 like I do, it's difficult to do that. Um, but you should. Or at least pre-decide that you're not going to have a Jesus fish on the back of your car. Like, or don't have a relevant church sticker. Like, hey, follow me to relevant church. Like, don't do that if you run somebody off the road. Like, that's, that's not what we want to do. Um, but I, I know this. Your faith and relationships require a pre-decision. Your faith and your relationships require a pre-decision. Faith, you have to pre-decide that you're going to follow Jesus. You have to decide that. God calls us, we choose to follow his lead. That's why we call ourselves Christ followers when we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We call ourselves Christ followers. That means that I was walking my path for a season and I have chosen to say, I don't want to follow my path anymore. I want to follow Christ and I want to walk the way he walks. I want to talk the way he talks. I want to act the way that he acts. Like I'm a, I'm a Christ follower. Where he leads, that's where I go. That's being a Christ follower. Joshua 24, 15 says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who does your house serve? See, our relationships need a predecision as well. Predeciding how you'll treat people around you. If you value love and kindness, then you predecide that you're going to speak words of encouragement even when you're frustrated. If you value forgiveness, you're going to predecide that you'll offer grace even when someone hurts you. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Don't let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And we're going to be done. Your purpose and your calling require a pre-decision. Your purpose and your calling require a pre-decision. Colossians says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. I think that it's interesting when people come and tell me that they hate their job. Especially according to this verse. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. What happens if you say that, if you go in and you say that you hate your job, what you're doing is you're saying, God, you made a mistake. But maybe God placed you there for this time and for this season for a purpose. That's bigger than what you can see right now. And if you work for the Lord, then you realize, God, you gave me this job. You provided this job for me. And so, God, I'm going to do whatever I can at this moment for this season to bring honor to you. I'm not working for them. Like, they, they may write my check, but, God, you, you provide everything for me. Like, shift, shift who your boss is. If your boss is Jesus, your day shifts and your attitude shifts. So today, I want to I want to give you a couple of action steps on how to predecide quickly. Identify your values. You want to learn how to predecide? Identify what value system you believe in. Identify areas where you're weakest at making decisions. All of us have issues at making decisions. All of us have weak areas on making decisions. 
So if you know you have a weak area, have somebody in there. So identify your weak areas and then <clears throat> create a plan. You've got to create a plan. And your plan has to do, include two things. It has to include God and it has to include accountability. Can I tell you this? How many of you have ever created a plan and then blown the plan because you never told anybody about the plan? Do you know why we don't tell people about the plan? Because I don't really want them to hold me accountable. I just want to feel better about myself for the season, but I don't want to tell God about it. I don't want to tell anybody else about it. When you tell God about it, you already have accountability with God. When you tell somebody else about it, you have accountability with them. And we need both of those things. Lastly, and I'm done. Dumb decisions are not made by dumb people. They're just not made by dumb people. They're made by people who don't predecide. Dumb decisions are not made by dumb people. Those are made by people who literally don't predecide. And all of us are included in that. I just want to encourage you today. Here's, here's the first thing. If you have never decided to follow Jesus as your personal Savior, you should do that today. Don't come to church to be religious. Come to church so you can be redeemed by Jesus Christ. That's why we should be here. It's for redemption. It's not for religious sake. Like, re religion... Religion is, is probably the most difficult things in our culture today. Religion is divisive. But a relationship with Jesus Christ is restorative. He restored us back to himself. If you have never trusted Christ as your personal savior, it's as simple as this. God, I realize I've been following the wrong path. I've been following my own decisions in my own way and it's not leading me where I wanna go. God, forgive me. I want to receive the forgiveness that comes from Jesus Christ and I want to turn and I want to follow you. I want to become a Christ follower today. I'm tired of following my own way. I want to follow Christ today. That's it. That's all you have to do. Man, if you make that decision, I don't want to embarrass you, but I'd love to pray with you and I'd love to celebrate with you. If you want to use the connection card, the digital connection card, you can use that to let me know about the decision you made. If you want to fill out one of the cards, uh, you can fill those out, drop it in the boxes on your way out or drop it off at our welcome tent. Uh, somebody will take that with you. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, I want to say thanks for being here. Um, like Stacy said, we're here for you. I want to <clears throat> encourage you this week. I know that all of us are praying about this storm that's coming. I'm, I, it brings anxiety. Decisions on should I go, should I stay? Should, we're, we're, what should we do? Should we board up? Should we not board up? Oh, there's so many decisions. I, I want you to know that when this storm passes, your church is going to be here to help you. So if you're impacted by this storm, I talked about it last week. I was at one of our members' house yesterday. I was at one member's house yesterday picking up some stuff that we had dropped off for them. I was at another member's house like finishing up some work that we had started earlier in the week. But if you get impacted by this storm, I want you to know your church family, we are here. We have a Serve Saturday plan for this Saturday. We have lots of plans already for what we're gonna do, but I will tell you, every one of those plans will get scrapped for whatever we have to do for this family and for this community. We're here for you guys. So be ready and listen Watch social media, check your emails. Like, if you haven't checked your email, you, you're, you missed me beeping the horn trying to get you out of the garage. So like today, when you leave the garage, guess what? Just drive out, that's what you get to do. And next week when you drive in, it'll, they're like we're working on it with the city. Hey, but praise the Lord, do you know what? We got free parking today. Our whole church got free parking today because the city forgot how to do what they were gonna do. So we got free parking, so yay God! Woo, I'll take it, that was great. Um, so when you leave today, just drive out. Let us know if you're impacted by the storm, though. Let us know. Text us. Message me on Facebook or social or any way that you need to get a hold of us so that we can be there to serve you guys. We love you guys. Let's stand and worship as we live.